Romans the 8th chapter in verse 29. It says, for whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. And here's what I want you to grab. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Father, open up the eyes of our understanding. Give us ears to hear, hearts to receive what the Spirit would say to the church today. You may be seated. I want to speak on this resurrection day from the subject, resurrected sons, plural, resurrected sons. The scripture says in prophesying about Jesus and the effect of Jesus' resurrection, he said that he predestined, determined ahead of time, for all of us to be conformed to the image of his son, which is Jesus, that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brethren. As much as we know that Jesus is the son of God, which is one of the things that is foundational to the Christian faith. And son, in this context, it means like, and like God and quality of God. Jesus was not sub-God. He wasn't similar to God. He was God in the flesh. He was fully God and fully man. He wasn't half God and half man. He was fully God and God and, and fully man. He came to earth and took on an earth suit and then God anointed him with the spirit without measure and G God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Ghost and power. He went about doing good, healing all that were pressed of the devil. And so Easter is a celebration of God the Father raising his son Jesus from the grave. As was depicted in the production this morning, it is the story of the empty tomb that people went expecting to see a body. But when they got there, they saw that the tomb was empty. The angel said, why seek ye the living among the dead? If you're looking for somebody who's living, you don't go to the cemetery. He said, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. And go let his disciples know. In Acts 2.27, there was a prophecy that was quoted from David that said, Thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Corruption would be, would, would, would be when the body starts decaying. Jesus' body never had the opportunity to decay because it was prophesied, Thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Hell in this context was the holding place of the souls, the holding place of those who had gone on before. And Jesus went there, and though, though it was silent, it looked like nothing was going on, and while people were mourning, Jesus was still working. Can I tell you, even when you're mourning, Jesus is still working. And the Bible says that he led captivity captives and, and gave gifts unto men. First Peter said that he, uh, 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 Paul said what in, that he ascended, but first he descended into the lower part. There's at least three or four scriptures that tells us that while Jesus in, was dead as they thought, he went down to the holding place of the souls. And while he was still supposedly dead, other people got up out of the grave and started walking around coming home. Can you imagine that? Okay, Jesus died, and all of a sudden somebody said, is that you, Cletus? <laughs> Folks got up because when Jesus went to hell, he led captivity captive. People who the grave and death had held on, he set them free. Jesus came to set people free. So even if you're going through hell, the good news is you don't have to stay in hell. He has promised he will not leave our soul in hell. If you're going through hell, I heard someone say this, if you're going through hell, just don't stop. Just keep on going. God will bring you out. And so the scriptures tell us over and over again that God raised Jesus from the dead. Acts 2 and verse 32. It says, this Jesus has God raised up whereof we all are witnesses. And this is Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. And in Acts the third chapter, Peter preaching again. He says, unto you first God, uh, Acts 3.26, unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Goes on in Acts 4 and verse 10. It said, this Jesus of Nazareth, who you crucified, God raised from the dead. And that's why this man who was lame from his mother's womb is now able to walk because Jesus is still living. 
Acts 5 and 30, the God of our fathers, it says, raise up Jesus whom you slew and hang on a tree. And so over and over, the scripture keep reminding us of God raising Jesus from the dead. Acts 10 and verse 40. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly. This was not, this was not a covert mission. The Bible says that, that after he was raised, he walked the earth and people saw him and he showed himself to his disciples. Even those who doubted that when he first appeared to his disciples, he just came into the room. That's where they got the song from, come into the room. And Jesus just came into the room. He didn't come to the window, he didn't come to the door, he did not. He showed up in the room, but Thomas wasn't there. And Thomas, they said, Thomas, we've seen the Lord. You should have been here. And he said, I will not believe unless. Can I say, you can set parameters around your, your belief or you can just believe. God will meet you at the level of your belief. God will meet you according to your faith. And so he set the conditions. The only way I believe is that I see with my eyes and that I put my hand in his hand, throw my hands in his side and see the wounds in his feet. And so Jesus, when he, he, he appears again, and as soon as Thomas sees him, he said, my Lord, my God. Jesus said, don't even try it. Come on here. Come here. Come here. Come here. You, you don't really believe it's me. He said, put your hands in my hand. Thrust your hand in my side and see that it's me. And so he appeared to people for proof that the resurrection was a reality. So I want to understand that the resurrection is both fundamental and foundational to our salvation. A lot of people differ about things. Based upon your various background, I come, I come from a very complicated Christian background. I started, I got, when I started off in church, I started in a high, in a, in a high sedity Baptist church. We didn't clap in my church. We had one sister who clapped in our church. That was Miss Hughes. Everybody know you always got that one sister. Okay, we didn't clap in my church. And, we, and, and, uh, and then every now and then, then we would clap on the fourth Sunday. I'm sorry, the fourth Sunday we clap. Because that's when the gospel chorus sang. And the gospel chorus was saying, oh, happy day, oh, happy day. And me, me, me and a few of the young people, we would be sitting there saying, you want to stand up? <laughs> and about three of us, we said, I'll stand up if you stand up. It was a big deal. Of, no, seriously. It was a big deal of stand. Say, you going to clap too? Say, come on, yeah, clap. So we said, come on, on the count of three, we all get it. And we would get up there. And then some of the people be looking around. Like, where y'all come from? Y'all know we don't do this in this church. And, 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 and them is used, she, she was a praiser too, but she didn't praise till it got quiet. So after the song started, and he taught me how to wash wa and pray. And, 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 oh, happy day. Everybody sit down. Then it got quiet. Reverend Wright, get up, and Miss Hughes, she started, yeah. Oh, yes, it did. Oh, yes, it did. Yes, it did. And then the, the nurses who didn't even know first aid. The nurses would run over with uniforms on and everything, just like they could really take your temperature. <laughs> Didn't know first aid, but they all had nurses. I mean, hats, the capes, and everything. They would come over, one get a fan, and the other one get smelling salt. We were at Bishop Jake's meeting a couple, couple weeks ago, and I said, where this child from? A woman, woman got the prayer, and somebody came over there and just got their fan. And I looked, I said, oh, oh that's what we do in a Bishop Jake's meeting now? This is what we, and somebody, and one, of the, one of these people said, stop it. <laughs> just, just, just go on. We don't have to do it. But so that's the kind of church I came. And then I went to Catholic school. I went, I went to Catholic school. I learned, I know more about Catholicism than Pastor Marsh, and she was raised a Catholic because she wasn't paying attention. Okay, but I really loved the Lord even as a young person. And so I, I said, you remember the Catholic? She said, no. And she was born Catholic, and, and, uh, and so I went to Catholic school. And then, and, then, uh, and then I got filled with the Holy Ghost at my uncle's storefront Pentecostal church at the age of 15 or 16. I started preaching in the Baptist church at 12 years old, okay? Um, and then I got licensed to preach at the age of 16. I got ordained at the age of, of 18. And then I went to, so what's a Catholic, Baptist, Pentecostal. Then I went to a Lutheran college. 
Okay? And after I went to Lutheran College, then I w we went to Maine, and then I got connected for about a year with the AME Zion Church, African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, okay? which was the split off from the AME Church. And then after being there, then I was involved in the Church of God in Christ. This is the Church of God in Christ. You can join it. You must be born in it. This is the church of God in Christ. I love the church of God in Christ. I love the church of God in Christ. You can't join it. Yeah, you must be born in it. Okay? And it wasn't even the church of God. It was the church of God in Christ. <laughs> and a good old culture person refers to it as the grand old church the largest African-American Pentecostal church. And then after all, all that, I said, this don't make sense. I'm, we just going to be non-denominational. <laughs> so now we are non-denominational church, but we're, we're really an interdenominational church because y'all got some of every background, okay? We're interdenominational. And so in the, Christian, in the Christian denominations, there are things that we don't all agree on or agree that's important. Some people put more emphasis on tongues. Some people believe you can still lay hands on the sick and be healed. Everybody does it. You don't have to believe that to be saved. Uh, so, some people believe that they're modern day apostles. Some people say, no, all, all the apostles died out with the apostles of the Lamb. You don't have to believe that there's modern day apostles to be born again or to be saved. Okay? Uh, some people say you got to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Some people say you got to be baptized only in Jesus' name. To stop the confusion here, we baptize in all of them. <laughs> is this church we baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name? So anybody ask you, you've been baptized in Jesus' name? Yes. Been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost? Yes. At the church, I was in the church of God in Christ. There was a woman there who came there, and she was from a particular uh, uh, one, this apostolic background, and she enjoyed our church. And she, she happened to be a white woman, too. But she, but she was from one of these churches where they just went in and they praised, and she, yeah, I really enjoy your church. She said, I just have one question for you. What name do you baptize in? And the pastor said, what name do you want to be baptized in? In other words, we're not going to fight over that kind of thing. So these, those things are not fundamental. But what is fundamental and foundational to the Christian faith, we must believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, which is why the Bible tells us in Romans 10 and 9 that we have to confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt believe in thine heart, what? That God raised him from the dead then thou shalt be saved. Meaning I can't be saved unless I believe and confess that with my mouth, that God sent Jesus, he died on the cross for my sins, and he was raised from the dead. You don't have to speak in tongues to be saved. You don't have to be baptized in one name or the other to be saved, but you do have to confess and believe. And so that's fundamental to our, our faith. The resurrection, y'all, is proof that the grave can't, couldn't hold Jesus down. The resurrection is proof that God's power is greater than Satan's power. The resurrection is proof that what the devil says is over doesn't have to be over. The resurrection is proof that life can begin again. The resurrection is proof that you can have a fresh start. The resurrection is proof that the devil is a liar. Amen. Acts 2.24 says, whom God raised him up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. It was not possible that the devil could be stronger than God. Yet as much as we celebrate Easter, the resurrection, as the resurrection of the dead and the resurrection of Jesus, we should also recognize it is as much the celebration of our resurrection as it is of Jesus' resurrection. Romans 8, 29, our text says, For whom he did foreknow, he predestinated to be conformed to his image, that he might be the firstborn among, his the key, many brethren. Many brethren. And so God started off with one son, but he wanted many sons. He wanted many. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord right on. Okay, God wanted many sons. He wanted many sons. He started with one, but he wanted many sons. God wanted a family, so he sowed a son. Let me say that again. God wanted a family, so he sowed a son. Because a person, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. And so just like when God told Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations, then he still challenged him to sow that first one, take him up, 
and sacrifice him. And then he, but, and then he said, because now I know that thou loveth me. You will obey me, seeing thou hast not withheld your only son. So God wanted family, so he sold a son. And John, because John 12, 24, which is the principle, tells us the principle of how we get many from one. It says, very, very, I say to you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. If it what? If it die, it bring. So I know, you know, we, we think a seed simply is planted, but that seed actually, once it goes into the earth, it dies. The, the outer shell deteriorates, and something happens with the seed on the inside of that and that dirt, and it germinates. And the Bible says it bringeth forth first the blade, then the, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. And so the scripture says that I, unless the grain of wheat go into the ground and die, it abides alone. God wanted a family of wheat. So he sold his son as a seed because a seed will meet any need. Are y'all seeing how the scriptures all come together here? First Corinthians 6.14 it says, and this Jesus, God raised him up. And will also raise us up by his power. So the resurrection is about God raising up his family to be in the likeness of his son. Colossians 2 and 12. You were risen with him through the faith which is of the operation of God. 2 Corinthians 4, 14. I know I'm giving a lot of scripture, but I'm laying a point here. He which raised up the Lord shall raise up us. He raises up us. Also by Jesus and shall present us with you. So when we think of the resurrection, say this with me. Say, I am resurrected with him. Come on, say, I got up with him. Paul gave more of the resurrection regarding how it applies to all of us as the sons of God. The Bible said, beloved, now we're the sons of God. Does not yet appear where we shall be, but we know when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. John, the first chapter says, as many as received him, the game, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Now, we're all children of God in the creative sense that God created all of mankind. But you don't become a son of God. You don't become a son of God until you make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life and you are born again. Nicodemus didn't understand it. He looked at Jesus. He was one of the religious, religious, religious leaders who was following Jesus. He was incognito. Okay? He didn't want everybody to know he was following Jesus, which is why he came to Jesus by night. He didn't want everybody to know he was slipping down there to that little storefront church where they was having church and he was seeing the power of God move. And he was, he was he's from a, 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 a high society in, in the in religious world. And so he comes by night. He said, Jesus, I'm kind of confused. One thing I know, nobody can do these things except God be with him. And Jesus said, you're trying to figure this thing out. He said, but let me explain it to you. He said, that which is flesh is flesh. That which is spirit is spirit. He said, what you realize, what you need to realize, Nicodemus, you must be Born again. When you are born again by the Spirit of God, that's how you become a son of God. It does not matter what's in your flesh. You can be born again. Well, this is just the way I am. This is the way I was born. You can be born again. Some, the Bible said we're born and we go forth telling lies. That don't mean God wants you to be alive for the rest of your life. You can be born again. Whatever your issue is, you can be born again. Whatever God requires of us, he empowers us to live up to his standard and not stay at your own standard. And so Jesus came to raise us up so that we can bring our life up to the level of God's standard and not try to bring God's standard down to the level of our lives. Jesus came and, was, and died and rose again so we can bring our lives up to the level of his word and not try to reduce his word down to the level of our lives. Somebody say, I've been resurrected. And so Paul puts it this way in Ephesians 2nd chapter verse 1, then I'm going down to verse 4 through 6. He said, and you have to quicken. That word quicken means made alive. Picture a defibrillator, someone who, who has, who's passed out and their heart has stopped and they get those and they, get, and they quickly shock his, they, they, they shock his, his, his heart back to, back to uh, life again. You have to quicken who were dead in trespasses and sin. Long as we're in sin until we meet Jesus, we are dead. You are literally a walking mummy, okay? You are dead even though you're physically alive, you're spiritually dead. But verse 4 says, but God, but means something's about to change, something being reversed here. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, wherewith he loved us, 
even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened, shocked us back to life. He quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. And then he goes on to say, and has raised, he doesn't say Jesus, raised us up together and made us. You see, he keeps saying plural. He, he raised us, he made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We've been raised up to be joint heirs with Christ. Furthermore, the Christian, the born again believer, us as redeemed sons of God, our resurrection is a finished and yet perpetual and ongoing resurrection. It's a finished resurrection, and yet it's a perpetual and ongoing resurrection. For those of us who are English majors, okay, the resurrection is in the present perfect progressive tense. It's the present perfect progressive tense. In other words, it's the, with the perfect present progressive tense, it puts emphasis on the course and the process, not just the result. It, the present perfect progressive tense is action that's still ongoing. The present perfect progressive tense is a finished action that is still influencing the present. Are y'all with me here? So Paul summarized the present perfect progressive tense of the resurrection when he says this in Galatians 2 and 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Are y'all hearing me here? I'm crucified and yet I live. I'm dead and yet I'm living. I'm crucified with Christ. That's my old man. That's what baptism is about. Ne nevertheless, I live. Yet, even though I'm living, it's not I, but Christ who liveth in me and the life. This natural life that you see me, I'm not, I'm, I'm having a natural experience, but I'm not a natural person. I said I'm living in a natural world, but I'm not a natural person. Look, somebody by say, you sitting next to a supernatural person. Oh, come on now. You got born again. If you received Jesus as your Savior, you are supernatural. That's why I keep telling you we're not average. We're not supposed to be living average. We're not supposed to be acting average. We're not supposed to be thinking average. God raised you up not to be average. I don't care whether the average person makes this and the average person can't go here and the average person can't, can't have that. God raised you up to be a joint heir with Christ. And so he says, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, the resurrection is present, is, is past, is present, and future all simultaneously. Let me say, that, say again. The resurrection is past, present, and future all simultaneously. The resurrection is past because we have been resurrected. Say that, say, I have been resurrected. We read it, Ephesians 2 and 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespass and sin. But God, in his great mercy for great love, where he loved us, has quickened us and made us alive. So we have been resurrected. That's the path. But the resurrection is also present. We are being resurrected. Say I'm being resurrected. Now catch this. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 says, Paul says, I don't care what we're going through. We don't give up. I don't care what we're going through. We don't cave in. I don't care what, we, what we're going through. We don't say it's over. But he says it this way. 2 Corinthians 4, 16, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perishes, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. So you didn't say it. He said because we live resurrected lives, I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting older, but I'm getting better. I'm getting older, but I'm getting stronger. That's why Caleb could say, give, I'm 85, did they give me this mountain? I want what God promised me 45 years ago. As a matter of fact, I got more faith now than I had 10 years ago. I got more experience with God than I had 25 years ago. Some of y'all stop, stop, stop talking about all the millennials taking over. The, the millennials need you boomers. They can't do it by themselves. They got the strength and don't even know what they're doing. Amen. Yeah, he, he, you, need, you, you need some older people with some wisdom, okay? I mean, I mean you, know, you know, most coaches are older than the players. The coaches can't do it, but they can show them what to do. Are y'all listening to me here? And so, and so, though our outward man perishes, our inward man is being renewed day by day. Let me give you that in three other translations so you can really get the revelation of the, of the, re, of the resurrection being present. He said, though, Amplified said, though our outer man is progressively decaying, and wasting away. Yet our inner self is being progressively 
renewed day after day. Oh, my goodness. And then the New Living Translation says, that's why we never give up. Come on, somebody say, I never give up. We are not of them that give up. The Bible said, we believe to the saving of the soul. We believe to everything in me knows it's going to turn around. We don't cast away our confidence. That's why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. I'm living in the present resurrection. And then the message translation says, even though on the outside, it looks like things are falling apart on us, on the inside, where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. Every day, new mercies I see. Every day, he's giving me more strength. Every day, he's giving me more grace. Sometimes, I don't even understand how I'm able to keep on going. A pastor here in the city who started his church maybe about seven, eight years ago, uh, at the time, at the time we, were, we, we, had just, we were celebrating 22 years. And he said to me, he said, Bishop Betty, he said, how do you pastor the same church for 22 years? I said, I take it one day at a time. He gives me strength day by day. Some of you, you're trying to rush those kids out the house. I just can't wait. I just can't wait. When you're 18, you're getting up out of here. Come on, just, just, just enjoy the trip. Because, see, because, what, after, because after they leave, you don't want to come back. Well, when you coming home? You've been saved 18 years. I can't wait till you get out of here. Are you coming home for Thanksgiving? You come home for Christmas? Well, you don't never come home. You told me my whole life. You can't wait for me to get out of here. You need to enjoy your day by day. Ask God to give you grace for every day. I told, I, I told y'all, and, and I had totally forgotten about I had told y'all about this. And, and somebody reminded me, I was talking to somebody. He said, remember, Mr. Bed, you told this story. But I remember uh, several years ago, you know, my, my daughter, she lives in New York now. And she's about to be 30 years old. But she was in college. And uh, she went to college at Coastal Carolina University. And her and her friend decided to take a trip to Atlanta. I didn't know they were taking a trip to Atlanta. Only is why I knew they were going to Atlanta. Now, if you're going to Atlanta from Coastal Carolina, down from Myrtle Beach, you got to come through Columbia. You follow me? She came through Columbia, went to Atlanta. I don't know. In the car, I bought her. We didn't even know she had passed through. Had a car full of friends. Didn't say, well, listen, let me stop by and say hi to my parents while I'm here. To my daddy who bought me this car. She didn't say that. The only way I knew she was coming is that uh, at the time, Minister Angel was driving me to our Florence church. And I'm on 20 going there on Sunday morning. And we riding, it's about 10, 15, or something like that. I'm, I'm riding on 20. I said, Peter, I said, that looked like my, my car. <laughs> it's my car. Okay, I bought it, my registration, my insurance, all this. Okay, I said, pull up. And she's just driving, riding on. I said, blow the horn. She blew the horn. I said, oh, he blow. She said, I've been busted. Don't tell me rise up and forget you ever raised to me. Ask God for grace, just enjoy it while you can, day by day. Are you hearing me here? Day by day, he gives us grace. Let me, let me move on. The resurrection is also future tense. We shall be resurrected. The 1 Corinthians 15, 20, but now is Christ risen from the dead, and he became the first fruit of them that slept. So Jesus was raised so that we can be raised up too. And Paul says, let me remind you of our final resurrection in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 7. He said, the Lord himself. Is going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ, those are the Christians who die before Jesus comes back in the rapture, shall rise first, then we which are alive shall be, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord and shall, shall we ever be with the Lord. I'm so glad I'm going to forever be with the Lord. Now, y'all can go ahead and reincarnate if you want. I'm going to ever be with the Lord. Now, you can come back here as a dog if you want and just keep on barking. I'm going to be with the Lord. You can come back as a cat, as your Aunt Lucy, or Chair, or whatever. But I'm going to ever be with the Lord. That's the hope of the Christian, amen, that I got, this, I got one life to live, and then I'm going to be with the Lord. I'm so glad I don't have to get a do-over. I'm going to do it the best I can and go on. 
Are, are you all hearing me? And so perhaps we can better understand the resurrection, get more of a revelation of the resurrection through the account of the prodigal son. As I start wrapping this up today, the account of the prodigal son is the story. I got ready to say, y'all know the story. Y'all know how preachers say, y'all know the story. And then people are like, no, I don't know the story. <laughs> preachers say, y'all know the story. No, you don't know the story. If, if I knew the story, I would be the preacher. <laughs> Just like I went to a concert. I went to a Nita Baker concert one time. And she started singing, oh. <laughs> and the crowd started saying, caught up in, I mean, hey. This is a concert. I didn't come here to hear them sing. I came here to hear you sing. You get the mic. So I know y'all saying you don't know the story. You need the preacher to tell you the story. So let me tell you the story in Luke 15 of the problem. So the Luke, Luke, the 15th chapter, it covers three losses. Is the lost sheep, where one leaves the 99 and goes and finds the one sheep. There's one who cleans the house because she lost one coin. And then there's the story of the lost son. And in each of them, there's joy and rejoicing when they find the sheep, when they find the coin, and when the son is found. And so this is a story of two sons, an older and a younger. The young, the young son, he's young, he's immature. He's obviously a little bit disrespectful because he says to his father, he says, give me the portion of goods that falls to me now. So I, it's, you know, I know after you die, I'm supposed to get an inheritance. I know I'm in the will and everything. But don't seem like you're going to die anytime soon. Just give me what belongs to me now. I know I don't get what, what, what the older one get, but give me the portion of them, that, uh, of the goods that, that, fall, that fall to me now. Okay? And to me, I, I just think that was disrespectful. I don't think, I don't think he was, he, he deserved to be Will Smith, Chris Rock Slap. Y'all don't think that's funny, ain't funny. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Which one you're mad about, Will or Chris? I don't know. Okay. People were upset about that. My, my daughter, my daughter, I'm telling you about, my daughter tweeted. She said, all y'all are upset about Chris, about Will Smith slapping Chris Rock. And so she put this out on Twitter. She said, is it all right for a parent to smack their child? I saw the tweet. And I responded, ask your mama. <laughs> she, she ain't responded yet. That's been out about three weeks. I think she was triggered and traumatized. I have never smacked my daughter. That's why I asked her to ask your mama. The prodigal son was somewhat disrespectful. Give me the portion of goods that fall to me now. And his father gave Gave him his money, gave him his inheritance. It said that not many days later, he went and took his journey into a far country. Far country represents that he went far away from God. It went far away from his upbringing, far away from his roots, far away from what he had been taught. For us, far away from the roots of the church, far away from everything that he knew. And sometimes people go far away because too many people know them at home. They want to go somewhere and be incognito. They want to go somewhere where people are not going to know them, where people aren't going to be looking at them and say, aren't you so-and-so and so-and-so? And so, and so they, they want, he went far from home so he could act out. He went far away from home so nobody would be his conscience and say, now you know you're better than that. You've been raised, but I know your mother, I know your father, I know, I know your brother. Uh, and so he goes far away from home into a far country. And sometimes, y'all, we, some of us spirits, we've gone to a far country. We have, I thank you, I'm glad you're here today, and God's glad you're here today. But some of you, you've gone to a far country spiritually. You've gone far from God. And then the Bible says not only that. He took all the resources that he got from his father, in this case, natural financial resources, and he wasted his substance on riotous living. And the only reason why we know what riotous living is is because when he comes home later, his brother tells. We all, we, it just would have been general. We could have just only imagined what riotous living. We could put your own definition of what riotous living was. But his brother told us riotous living, he spent his money. I got to make it real plain for those of you who, who, who don't know certain words. He, he spent his money on hoes. Okay? Okay? Uh, that, that, you, you ain't mad, are you? Because they didn't come to church today. 
So I know you ain't mad because they ain't here. They down at the strip club. Let me see anybody mad at me. <laughs> he spent his money, the Bible said, harlots. Okay? He spent his money living it up at the strip club, uh, go, going to the club. Drinks on me! He, he spent his money being a big spender, and he wasted his, okay, in, come on, in, can any of us be honest and say, we wasted some money? Uh-huh, yeah, I, I, I'm feeling right here. Some of y'all spent all, you wasted yours on weed, or right over in that section over there. Yeah, some of y'all, uh, uh, oh, yes, Lord, you wasted yours on alcohol, right up in here. Uh, oh, Lord, you wasted all that money at the club. Some of y'all, oh, you wasted the money on the lottery? All of us, we have wasted money, and, and all of us, we can look back and say, man, if I had that now, what I would have done, okay? Because we all had dumb days. We all, come on, if you ever had dumb days, raise your hand, okay? If you haven't raised your hand because you're still living in them right now. We all had dumb days. Man, man if I knew better, I would have done better. But that, that's, why, that's why I'm so glad I thank God for the grace of God. The grace of God allows you to keep going without looking back. I can't change my past, but I can have a better future. Grace lets me have a better future without me living in guilt and condemnation about my past. He wasted his money on rights of living. And some of you here today, you realize you wasted time, you wasted money, you wasted talent, you wasted energy, you wasted your body, you wasted time in the wrong relationships. My daughter, she's spending her time right now, it seems like almost like life coaching. A lot of young ladies in their 20s and 30s, and I was talking the other day, I asked her about, about a, I don't know why I keep talking about my daughter today. I, I asked her the other day about, about a particular friend she went to college. She said, Dad, she said, I'm so proud of her that, that she broke up with a boyfriend. I said, why are you proud of her? She said, because she said she realized that she had to go see him, and she would tell him he loved her, he, that she would tell him that she loved him, and he would say thank you. Okay, and she said, I realized, she said, she said, finally she realized, she realized, she said, no, she said, anybody that loves me, I don't have to try to make them love me. I would know you love me. I, you would put me first. Come on now. And my, my daughter said, Dad, I'm so glad she made that decision early because I see so many young ladies who spend their time in years in relationship trying to make somebody love them. Okay, I did it for one semester. I'm glad I'm doing it. I, yes, I did. I grabbed that, I grabbed that, that Diane Ross song. I'm going to make you love me. Yes, I will. And, and she just kept spending my money, and no, she didn't. Okay? And so, and so you, you got to realize that sometimes we wasted our time, our substance. Some of us, but God is the God of another chance. Notice how they say God's the God of a second chance. God's the God of another. Come on, somebody, somebody thank God for another chance. Because most of us, we don't even remember this when we needed the second one. But we know I need another one. We, we, we went past that second chance a long time ago. God's the God of another chance. Some of you here, you realize you wasted. And he spent his time partying, rising, living. And then the Bible says a famine arose. A famine arose. Where a famine is caused, usually caused, of a drought. During a drought, there's no vegetation. There's no harvest. There's no productivity. A famine arose. And as a result of the famine arising, they, they're going through a desperate time. For this famine for us could mean a pandemic. Famine for us means times of recession. Famine for us means times of unemployment. Circumstances beyond our control. The Bible doesn't say that God sent the famine. It doesn't say the devil sent the famine. Sometimes famine just happens because we live in a fallen world. There are things that you go through, don't try to blame God, and sometimes it ain't even the devil. You just need to be in a situation that you can go through it. Can, can you hear me? Say, you hear what I'm saying? There was, there was a time, every time there was a lack, there was lack. I said, that devil trying to attack my finances. No, I attack my finances by buying the wrong thing at the wrong time. And some, I'm telling y'all, the, the, the Bible says that Satan is accuser of the brethren, but some brethren are the accuser of Satan. If the devil here today, he said, now, now hold up, I didn't do that. I did not repossess their car. They stopped making the payment. Sometimes circumstances happen. Famine arose. And he was not prepared for the famine because, watch this, he went too far from home. He got with the wrong people. I didn't quite, quite get to that. He, he made some bad decisions, which goes on. The fourth thing did, he then made a desperate decision in a temporary situation. 
he jumped out the frying pan into the fire. The Bible said when he began, he began to be in want. When he began to be in want, he, he's so full of pride, he said, I'm, I'm going to try to make this work. I'm, I, I'm not going back home. I ain't going to ask nobody for nothing. I'm going to make it work. He dug in. He made a desperate decision, and he connected himself to a, to a citizen in that far country. Can I tell you, just because you go far from home, you don't have to get connected to everybody who's out there. Oh, you hear me? Just because you're not where you used to be, don't get connected to everybody where you are. Because you know that's not where you're planning on staying. Come on now. You know this is you. You, you got to remember who you are. If you don't know who you are, you'll get connected to people who don't know you are. Who you are. If you forget who you are, you'll get with people who don't know who you are. Are y'all hearing me here? When, 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 I, when I met Marcia, uh, I was already a preacher. I didn't tell her I was a preacher. I was already a tongue talker. I didn't tell her I was a tongue talker. And so I, she knew I was a Christian. I brought her to church. And when I brought her to church, it was my turn for to read. And I got up and read the scripture. And then I prayed my prayer. And we got finished service. She said, uh, you didn't tell me you was a priest. I said, I assure you, I ain't no priest. I didn't tell, she, she learned who I was. Some of you are hiding who you are because you done gone far from home. They don't really know that's how you were raised. They don't know that the way you're living isn't how you believe. Come on now. They don't know that you have lowered your standards for them. They don't know that you have stripped yourself of your own identity to take on their identity. But this is homecoming day. And God said you're going to have to remember who you are and whose you are. Oh my God. He connected himself to a citizen in that country. And because that man who he connected himself to, who he started working for, who he should never have started working for, he sent him into the pig pen to feed swine. Of all the jobs, it would be like somebody not knowing who I am and offering me a job to sell drugs. But because I'm so desperate, I start selling crack. Now, if he knew I was a bishop in the Lord's church, he might not ask me to do that. But because I'm so far away from home and I don't look like who I am and I'm not talking like who I am, he would dare to ask me to sell crack. Are y'all hearing me? Just, just because I'm not showing who I am and he's not knowing who I am. You better preach her. Look at somebody say, don't forget who you are. Don't forget who you are. Oh, I, I, I know you're going through a hard time now, but don't forget who you are. I know you're unemployed right now, but don't forget who you are. I know people have gotten on your nerves, but don't forget who you are. I know you're desperate for a man, and you want to boo, and you want to bang, but don't forget who you are. He was so desperate, got connected to this man. The man sent him into the pig pen. Sent him into the pig pen to feed swine. This is a kosher Jewish boy. My, 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 uh, my grandson, he's two. He was with me around the pool the other day. And I went to clean the filters out in my pool. And when I pulled it, it was just, you know, he had some leaves and some, you know, stuff that fall off. And I, and I opened it up. He said, ew. He's two. He said, ew. Then I put my hand down there to grab some stuff. He said, ew. Nasty. He can't say a whole lot of words, but he knew ill, and he knew nasty. This boy in the pig pen says, ew, nasty. But he is so far away from home, compromising who we are, that he gets in the ill, nasty places, doing stuff he would never do if he was home. Uh, Y'all, who am I talking to in here today? He got down with the ew and the nasty, and then it got so bad, he was in such a desperate situation, the Bible said he would fain have filled himself with the husks that the pigs did eat. He almost started eating pig food. A lot of preachers miss it. They say he started eating pig food. But he, he said he would have. When, when he, 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 he looked at, he was feeding the pigs, and he went and said, I, I could have a V8. The Bible said he 
came to himself. I don't care how far you are away from home. This is your decision. You need to make sense to come to yourself. This is not who you are. That's not who you were created to be. That's not what you've been taught. And that's not what you believe. And this is not who you are. And don't let your, don't internalize your circumstances. This may be where you are, but this is not who you are. Oh, come on. I said this may be where you are, but this is not who you are. He came to himself. And when he came to himself, he said, I will arise. I'm going to go back to my father. And he rehearsed a speech. He rehearsed it. I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to say, Father, Father, I've sinned against heaven. Against thee. No, I've sinned against thee. It's in heaven. And, uh, 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 oh, yeah. I'm going to say, I'm no longer worthy to be a servant. Just make me your son. Just make me one of your hired servants. And he practiced this speech. And he had to take the long journey back home. He spent all his money so he couldn't buy a plane ticket. He spent all his money so he couldn't get a chariot. He couldn't get a train. He had to take the long journey home, and now he's weak. He's hungry. He is down to his last because he got ready to eat that, and he realized he was perishing from hunger. Some of you, the reason why you're in this situation you're in, you, you, you realize there's an empty space in your heart. There's an empty bowl in your life. And you are perishing from hunger. And you don't need no peanut butter and jelly. Those have been in church for a minute. There was a song that said, our little boy, I think it was Shirley Caesar, somebody like that, said, huh? Him. Song said, I don't need, she saw the boy crying. He said, said boy, said, I don't need, she got ready. When you want a peanut butter and jelly, she said, I don't need no peanut butter and jelly. I need my soul to be saved. The, the, the emptiness in you, the empty bowl in your life is not going to be filled with weed. It's not going to be filled with another man, another woman. It's not even going to be filled with money. What you need, only Jesus can fill. And so he came to the place of realizing, I can't get what I need where I am because they don't have it. I can't get what I need where I am because they don't have it. So he had to make a decision to leave the harlots to leave his so-called new friends, to leave being the one who was the life of the party and humble himself with his now decrepit, smelling like pig pen self, looking depraved self and humble himself and he decided to repent and go back home. To repent, it means if I'm going this way, I go that way. To repent means about face. If I'm going north, I go south. If I'm going south, I go north. If I'm going east, I go west. If I'm going west, now I start going east. It means to now turn around and repent and head in the right direction. He decided to repent and go home because he came to himself. God's saying to somebody who came here today, you think it's just a coincidence, but God's telling you, you got to come to yourself. How long are you going to live like this? How long are you going to halt between two opinions? How long are you going to act like who you know you're not? How long are you going to stay out here trying to make it on your own, try to prove to somebody that you don't really need them and you don't need God like that, that your education is enough? that you got what it takes. God said what you need can only be found in me. So he arose. Resurrection. He arose. And he went back to his father. It takes humility to go back. I said it takes humility to go back. Some people keep going and digging in and stuff get worse because they got too much pride to go back. Sometimes you got to go back. The Bible says repent and do your first works over. Sometimes you got to go back. We started this ministry, and uh, when I started our ministry, I was, uh, even though my pastor released me, I never felt he sent me off right, and I was upset about that for a long time. And then after we started, you know, uh, uh, you know God, God, God had, to, had to fix some things. And then I had, I had a former minister in my church who I considered a son break my heart. I can speak about it very transparently now. Really broke, broke my heart. And it, to this day, it still has remnants of it in terms of how I connect with people, even people in, in our church. And I considered him a son. And he told me I was just, I was, he said, he said, I was just, we were employer, employee. I said, okay. And so, and, and so when, when my heart got broken like that, I called my former pastor. And I said, if I ever did to you 
what he did to me, I need you to forgive me. Sometimes you got to humble yourself enough to go back and get it right and not be full of pride and dig in and say, it's all right. The Lord knows my heart. No, you got to go back. That's why we call it homecoming day. Some of you, I know some of you didn't even plan to be here, but God said, this is your homecoming day. And he arose and went back to his father. But here's the good news. And he's, he, he got his speech prepared. He got his speech prepared for what he's going to say to his father because he's trying to say it just right so his father can receive him. So his father won't rehearse. You should have never did this and never did that. He got it all prepared in a way that at least hopefully my father will just let me come. He don't have to treat me like a son. Just treat me as good as when you treat one of your employees, one of your servants. He's, and on his way back, I can see him just crawling back and he's, oh, father, I this heaven. Just make sure you say it right and, 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 and try to get it right. And on the way, his father we know his father's older, that's why he wasn't dead yet, okay, and, and why he asked for his, his inheritance. His father's looking. Can I tell you, the father's still looking for you? You may be a long way from home, but the father's still looking because he knows what he placed in you. The father knows what he invested in you, and he's expecting a harvest on what he sold in you. He's expecting a return on his investment in you, and the father's looking, and as he is crawling, barely making it step by step the father still got pep in his step come on now just because you tore up don't mean the father tore up the father still is ready to receive you and the father saw him and the father ran to meet his son I said the father ran to meet his son his father saw him and threw a homecoming for him his father was just happy. He, the, his, father, his father didn't even have to say, just the fact that he was coming, his father knew how he had repented. Just because he was coming, his father knew he had humbled himself. Sometimes you don't have to say anything, but yes, Lord, just as I am, without one plea, I come. Come on. You, you don't have to get all your words right. Just the fact that you would dare to come, dare to come forward. God said, I see your heart, and I'm ready to receive you father saw him coming and Luke 15 20 says the father arose he arose came to his father and when his father saw him a great way off his father saw him he had compassion that means love and action and he ran and he fell the father fell on his neck the father fell on his neck and he kissed his son the father could have sent for him. The father could have retrieved him, but a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. You got to make up your mind that you need the Lord. You got to make up your mind that this life isn't working for you. You got to make up your own mind. And sometimes when you got grown children and people who know better, you got to let that thing play its course. But after play this course, if you would just make up your mind and say, I need God, this isn't working. The Father is right there and he will run to you, throw his arms around you and it give you all his love. The thing about God is that he's not growing in love with you. He's not saying, you know, if I get to know you better, you'll get more of my heart. When you get God, you get all of his love, all of his heart, all of his mercy, all of his grace. When you get God, you get all of God, all of his love. He had compassion. He ran, fell on his neck. Then Luke 15, 22 says, Father said to a servant, bring forth the best robe. The best robe. He repented and the father still gave him his best. He still gave him his best. He didn't hold against him what he's done. He didn't say, you don't deserve this. He still gave him the best. That's what grace does for you. That's what mercy does. God will still give you his best, even though all you have is what's left. He will still give you his best, even though you've spent your life. He will still give you your best, his best, even though all you have is your heart now. I said here when I was coming up, I didn't always understand it. The older people of the church used to say, 
We used to sing a song that said, come to Sunday school, learn about the golden road, be safe and secure from all alarm. Learn why Jesus died. Learn how with him you'll ride and live with him forever on high. And then we had this verse. We'd sing this in Sunday school. A child saved is a soul saved. P-L-U-S, a life, plus a life. Because sometimes when you get too old, all God got is a heart. But if you get saved young enough, he got a life. Come on now. He can use you. He can use your hands. He can use your effort. He can use your influence. That's why the Bible said, remember, the, remember now you're created in the days of your youth. While before the evil days come, when your heart of hearing, he said, and the, and the, and the eyes are dim, and the grinders, I mean the teeth are few. That, that, that's in Ecclesiastes. Give God a life, not just your heart. And the younger you get saved, the more life that God has to give you in exchange for you giving him your life. He that will try to save his life, try to do your own life, he said he'll lose it. But if you give him your life, he gives you the real God kind of life. So Luke 15, he says to his servants, bring forth the best robe, put it on him, and put a ring on his finger. That ring represents authority. That ring represents ownership. That ring represents, this is my child. This is my son. This represents, I'm giving him the same authority that I have. The ring represents, I'm restoring him to his place that he had with me before, his, before he left. That's what Jesus died for. That's what the grace of God does. That's what the blood is for. He said, put shoes on his feet. Then he said, and bring the fatty calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. He threw a homecoming party for him. The fatted calf is what one that they prepared for special occasions, for special, if the king was coming, the governor was coming, they saved the best. He said, I'm giving this for my son. Can I tell you, God gave his best for you when he gave Jesus. Prepare the fatted calf, kill it, and let us eat and be merry. Look at verse 24. For this my son was dead and is alive. Resurrection. He was dead, but he's alive. He was lost, and now he's found. And they began to be money. Excuse me. And they began to be merry. To the left, to the left. Slide to the left. Slide to crisscross. Crisscross. Can you wobble, wobble, wobble? They started the music. They started partying. He says, because my son, who was dead, is now alive. My son, who was dead, is now found. And in the context of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son, Jesus says in Luke 15 and 7, I say likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repents, that turns around more than over 99 just people which need no repentance. So I want to let you know, if you're here to repent today, whether you came for or not, we threw this for you. God's got plans for you. God's got plans. This is your party. This is your homecoming day. And then the older brother said, we did all this for him. We did all this just for them. And the father says in Luke 15 and 32, it was meat. Meat is right. It's appropriate that we should make merry and be glad for this your brother was dead and is alive. This is resurrection day. He was lost and now he's found. So my final word to you today is no matter how long you've been gone, How far you've been gone. What you said, what you did, who you did it with, what you lost. No matter how long you've been gone. Because God's such a loving father, he leaves the door open so you can come home. That's the story of the prodigal son. His, some of y'all don't know, but Jewish people to this day, and they say it and they mean it. If there's an orthodox Jewish family and someone in that family gets born again and gets saved, they will say about that person, he's dead to me. How, how, how many of y'all know that there are Jew, Jewish people say that? They say he's dead to me and they mean that. 
You can't come to Passover anymore. You can't come to the house anymore. They, and some of them, they said, they said they would actually have a ceremony to show that you are dead. This father didn't do that. He said, he's dead, but I believe he's going to come alive. He's gone far, but I believe he's going to make his way. So he kept the door open. The father's love to you is a love that always keeps the door open. No matter how long you've been gone, what you did. And can I tell you, the devil tries to make you think you're too far gone. But you can be brought nigh, brought close by the blood of Jesus. The resurrection, y'all, is for sons. Whom he did foreknow, he predestinate to be conformed to the image that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. So the final word. The final door to this message. On this homecoming resurrection Sunday is that just like the grave couldn't hold Jesus back and hold him in, sin and your bad decisions can't hold you back and hold you down. You can get out. The gates of hell cannot prevail against you. The blood has opened the way. Thank God for Jesus who laid the foundation. Thank God for Jesus who opened up the way. Thank God for Jesus who leads me each day. Thank God, thank God, thank God. Everyone standing today.